Hi, I'm Sholina Spinoza. I'm a third year medical student at St. George's University in Grenada, West Indies. And this series of discussions are really based off of my experience as a facilitator in helping other people at my school to learn and to integrate immunology content. So essentially what we'll do is we'll just go through the quizzes that that I wrote personally that are based off of my course in immunology with Dr. Jacqueline Stanley. Of course I'm not a PhD in immunology, I'm a med student and so um, just bear in mind uh, where I'm coming from in terms of the content. So in terms of the human immune system, I didn't have any background in immunology, but I had some background in warfare, and they're very similar in terms of how they interact with each other and with their environment. And my, essentially my background was I was a pilot, a military pilot, a commercial airline pilot, and also spent some time in Iraq as an embedded journalist. So some of my analogies will come from that experience. And the thing about the immune system that I learned early on and has really helped me to keep in the background is, is the primary function is to recognize self from non-self and to eliminate non-self. So again, self versus non-self, okay? And there's an entire sort of cascade of ways that we do that and we'll go into that. And then to eliminate or to kill non-self, all right? And they say, you know, that even human, or not human, but even sponges, I guess there are some human sponges, but even sponges uh, can recognize self from non-self. So this is very much conserved throughout nature. So that's the first thing that you want to keep in the background as we're going through this content. The next thing that you want to think about is who's involved in this, okay? So one analogy that I heard actually in pathology class was it's almost like a concert, okay? You have the rock star, if you will, uh, and then you have, which would be the cells. So we got the cells acting, okay? And so who are these cells? These cells, particularly in immunology, we've got your phagocytes, okay, which phago to eat, okay? And we'll talk about the different types of those. And then you also have the beloved T cells, the very smart adaptive immunity T cells. You have the B cells, you have the NK cells, and some other cells that we'll talk about as we go on, but these are essentially the, the cells of the human immune system, and those are sort of the rock stars, if you will, in this concert. And then the other component of this is, okay, well, every rock star has to have a stage. So what's the stage? And the stage in this case would be your blood vessels, okay? So this would be your vessels. And if you think about it, most of the way that it was described uh, to me was that a lot of times in terms of studying the human immune cells, we're looking at them sort of as they're traveling to and fro, not necessarily in the tissues. But the idea is, is obviously that they go from the blood cell and then they crawl into, or diapodesis we say in immunology, into the tissues themselves, okay? So that's, a com that's an essential component of it, and particularly when we start talking about inflammation. And then the last part, but certainly not least, and therefore I'm going to uh, start over, because I would say that in any given immunology course or any board exam, a lot of what you'll be tested on is this, which is the music or the cytokines, okay? So cytokines, I didn't know what the meaning of that word was when I started immunology, learning it. But essentially the way I think of cytokines is they're almost like hormones, right? They're the hormones of the immune system that essentially tell the cells what to do, uh, how to act, if they should secrete reactive oxygen species, if they should proliferate or act in any other way. So the cytokines are essentially the music that make everything flow in terms of immunity as well as uh, protection and eliminating non-self. So like we said, the three components are the cells and the vessels and the cytokines. So with that sort of overview, let's go into the first quiz that we talk about, which is uh, question number one. Which of the following is a specific component of the innate immune system? So we have A, lysosome, B, lysozyme, C, IL-4, and D, histamine. So essentially when I sit back from this question, you look at, okay, which of these 
deal with innate immunity, like we say. Lysosome, as you know probably from other classes, is essentially that component intracellular. Lysosomes, we have lysosomal storage diseases, we have lysosomes that carry out a myriad of different activities, not only with regard to the immune system. So we can eliminate that straight away because that's not specific to the immune system, which is what that key word in the question asks for. The second uh, choice is lysozyme, okay? And I always confuse sort of lysosome and lysozyme. Lysosome is that little vesicle that has a variety of functions like we talked about, whereas lysozyme is part of is part of the lysosome, essentially is part of the human immune system's ability to kill uh, to, to kill the bad guys so let's talk about that quickly is within your lysosome okay which is in the cell you have a bunch of little goodies in there to help you eliminate bacteria the bad guys to kill them to cut them up and to display them ultimately for uh, antigen presentation so what's in there okay so within a lysosome you have a lysozyme okay which we just talked about, which is the correct answer to this question. And what that does is that essentially chops up the bacteria cell wall, the murenic cell wall. So that's one of the things that the lysozyme does. And, and, and the lysozyme can also be found in sweat and tears. So it's an antibacterial, if you will. Okay? And chops up the cell wall. What else do you have? You have lactoferrin. Okay? So we know the word ferrin would be uh, due to iron, and the bad guys, they need iron in order to survive. So lactoferrin essentially keeps the iron from the bad guys. So that's also another component of the lysosome. And what else do we have? We have defensins, okay? That's a nice uh, defensins. So defensins are kind of like bullets that shoot through the uh, particular pathogen and eliminate that pathogen. So that's another uh, nice thing that we've got to our disposal. And then we have this beautiful enzyme called myeloperoxidase. Uh, Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but as you know from your, your course already, myeloperoxidase essentially creates bleach. Okay, so it, it, it takes uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, okay, which is made from uh, another enzyme, which we'll talk about, NADPH oxidase, essentially that process, which is also part of the innate immune system, produces your myeloperox or produces your hydrogen peroxide, and this enzyme adds uh, chloride, and you get bleach, or hypochlorite. Okay, and that is particularly toxic, as you might imagine, to any of us, and namely the pathogens. So that is, uh, those are the components of the lysosome. Lysosome, I made my own mistake. Lysosome. So if we look at choices C and D, IL-4, we haven't talked about interleukins. Interleukin means essentially between leukocytes, if you will. That's the way I think of it anyway. So IL-4 is a cytokine we'll get to later, and histamine is released by mast cells, which we'll also get to later, and histamine is uh, very instrumental with regard to inflammation, which any of you who have allergies know that histamine is not, uh, is, is, uh, is not something that you want a lot of, but it's an integral, integral part of, of inflammation. The second question is on innate immunity. So just as sort of a true fault, innate immunity has memory, okay, is, or is it, uh, is specific to the pathogen, requires a longer response time than adaptive immunity, or D involves the recognitions of PAMPs, or uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Okay, so the first three describe adaptive immunity. Like we talked about before, is once your system uh, goes through innate immunity and the pathogen is presented to your adaptive immunity, which would be your T cells, then you get a proliferation of the T cells as well as the B cells and you have memory. Okay, so that's the power of that innate immunity. As though you had a bad guy, you knew that he was coming through, you found him, you put out an all points bulletin and you have a memory of that. It's forever in your database, okay? Um, it's specific to the pathogen, exactly. That's adaptive immunity. C requires a longer response time 
than adaptive immunity. No, as you might imagine, our adaptive immunity typically requires about a week or so, okay? So at least. Um, so initially, it's the short term, which is innate immunity, and that involves the recognition of the pattern in associated molecular patterns. So let's talk about the PAMPs. So the PAMPs quickly are those aspects that are unique to non-self, okay? So you recognize them uh, straight away, all right? Pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So that might be, for example, in the case of a gram-negative uh, bacteria, that might be LPS, or that might be some other component of a, of a, let's say, for example, of a gram-positive bacteria. Or it might be a double-stranded RNA. Now that one's straight away, we know is not part of our you know, is part, not part of our DNA. You don't ever see double-stranded RNA in the human immune system, or sorry, in the human body. So those are straightaway pathogen-associated molecular patterns. It, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a T cell to figure that out. You can immediately figure that out if you're a macrophage or if you're uh, a phagocyte, okay, which is the same thing. All right, so the answer there is going to be D. C is which of the following is an example of a pathogen associated molecular pattern. And again, uh, straight, straight off the bat, double-stranded RNA, you can see that that's not going to be part of the human immune system. Now, is anyone going to ever ask you these uh, questions about, you know, unpacking the specifics of, of which is self and non-self? Pro you know, probably not, but, uh, but you should recognize that if something particularly LPS uh, would be a good one for a gram-negative bacteria. And one of the things that the, that the immune cells have, okay, so there's, for example, LPS is what I just said. What on the immune cell enables it to recognize that gram-negative component? And that is what they call a toll-like receptor, toll-like uh, receptor, okay? And so we have TLR4 is the one uh, that recognizes LPS. I just want a lipopolysaccharide, so you know that that's a component of gram-negative bacteria, cell walls. So toll-like receptor, I thought, well, where does this word come from? Well, as it turns out, the Germans discovered it, and toll is like a word that's like, oh, cool, you know, that this is great, that we discovered this. It was actually, I'm told, discovered on Easter Sunday, working very hard uh, in Germany. So essentially, your macrophage, okay, or your phagocyte, okay, your phagocytic cell, he has a toll-like receptor, and it's specific in this case for LPS, okay? There's other toll-like receptors uh, for other components. So again, you know, the details of that are not important, but it is important to recognize that, that the PAMP, okay, is on the bad guy, pathogen-associated molecular pattern, okay, and that this guy, the, the pattern, pattern recognition receptor, the PRR, is on the good guy, and that's a toll-like receptor. Okay, we'll ask more of these questions as we go through. Four, if you were to see a number of lymphocytes in a histological sample, you would expect this to be what kind of response? Would it be an innate response or would it be an adaptive immune response? Okay, so when we say the word lymphocyte, we think B cells, T cells. B cells, T cells are part of the adaptive immune system. Okay, so straight away we know that that's going to be adaptive. Name a type of cell you may have seen in question number four. So what kind of cell might you see that's going to be a lymphocyte is really all this is asking. And the correct answer would be C, which is T cells, which we just talked about. B cells and T cells are lymphocytes. And then what are A, neutrophils and basophils? Okay, neutrophils are phagocytic cells. And uh, basophils, as you know, are cells that are in the blood, in the vessels, that eventually become your tissue mast cells, okay? But those are not, those are not part of your lymphocytes, okay? They are leukocytes, but not lymphocytes. Number six, which of the following is considered primary lymphoid tissue? Okay, so first of all, let's just talk quickly between primary lymphoid tissue and secondary lymphoid tissue. So primary lymphoid tissue is just Essentially, where are these guys born? Okay, where are the where are the where are the cells of the immune system, if you will, born? And so we have obviously the bone marrow. Okay, uh, you know you start off 
uh, in the yolk sac and the liver and then you eventually end up in the bone marrow we're talking about fetal development but as far as you and I are concerned our primary lymphoid tissue is the bone marrow at this point of our lives unless we have some kind of a cancer in which case you have extra uh, medullary portions where throughout the body where maybe the liver starts generating lymphoid tissue again or sorry uh, lymphoid cells again okay so that's the primary so where is it it's the bone marrow and it's also the thymus okay so initially the bone marrow you've got this is where uh, essentially everybody is you've got your myeloid okay so you got your myeloid cells, which are going to be your neutrophils, your phagocytes, all those guys are coming from the bone marrow. And then you also have your lymphocytes, which we just talked about. Okay, so those are B and T cells. Okay, B and T cells. But the thymus is unique because while you have T cells here, they don't become fully functional T cells until they go to the thymus for maturation. So, uh, and we'll get into T cell development as we come along. But, but uh, they start off in the bone marrow. So those are your two primary sites. Your secondary sites are going to be uh, your lymphoid tissue. So you got your lymph nodes, your spleen. So you got your nodes. Okay, the spleen is a great place for secondary. And then of course you have your mucus associated the lymphoid tissue, your malt tissues. So these are some of the major places uh, as well that you see the secondary lymphoid tissue. And why that's important is, is when we get to antigen presentation, this is where your friendly T cells hang out, okay? So this is where your T cells and your B cells, uh, it's not a very good B, B cells hang out, okay? And that's where the antigen can take their little gut bad guy, present it, and say, looky, 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 we need to get the word out and get these guys going and eliminate this pathogen. Okay, so this is the secondary, secondary lymphoid tissue. Okay, and these kind of things are, you know, low-hanging fruit that they like to test. The question is, which of the following is considered uh, primary lymphoid tissue? I'm on number six. So the uh, bone marrow, yes, we just talked about that. Lymphoids, no, that's secondary. Spleen, no, that's secondary. D, thymus, yes, that's primary. That's where those T cells go for maturation. And so the answer is A and D above. Number seven, your patient has neutropenia. Which of the following cytokines would stimulate the production of the deficient cells, i.e. granulocytes? Okay. So first of all, first word is neutropenia. Penia, anything that's penia means small, okay? So anemia, neutropenia. So there's a few, there's a low number of neutropenia. So I always try to think clinically because, you know, the, the sooner we bring that, it's easier to remember for one thing for me. So neutropenia, I think, what kind of patient would be neutropenic? Well, perhaps somebody that just went through some kind of chemotherapy therapy to blast the heck out of their uh, bone marrow in order to cure their cancer, okay? So the reason why uh, this is a realistic question is because it's unfortunately very common to be neutropenic, okay? And then also, the other reason why you'll see questions like this is because there's actually drugs that target this. So drugs that are essentially growth factors for your immune cells. And so that's why uh, this is a favorite. So let's talk about this for a second. So as we talked about, the primary lymphoid tissue, right, you have the bone marrow, all right? And so you got to have a growth factor. Growth factors like we talked about are kind of like hormones, which are kind of like cytokines. So that's what we were talking about earlier. So you have this, you have a stem cell, okay? So this is your stem cell. And essentially, if you want to differentiate the stem cell, right, it can go into this myeloid where you've got your neutrophils, okay? Uh, so in the myeloid, you can have uh, macrophages, you can have neutrophils, you can have eosinophils, uh, you can have basophils, okay? So that's your myeloid differentiation or you can go into your uh, you can go into your T and B cell area so your T and, your T and B cell area is going to be your lymphoid
so this is going to be T cell, uh, B cell, and NK cell, which we'll get into. NK cells are kind of oddballs. They're very interesting oddballs. So if we wanted to say like a general hemopoietic, the mother of all cytokines for any kind of lymphoid or any kind of myeloid, it would be interleukin-3, okay? So that's going to make you grow myeloid cells or that's going to make you grow your BT and K cells, okay? If you wanted to further differentiate here, it's IL-7, okay? So that's going to be your growth factor for this. If you wanted to further differentiate here, okay, particularly eosinophils and basophils are oddballs, okay? This is IL-5, which we'll get to, and we don't really get into what makes the, the basophils grow for this course anyway at SGU uh, at this stage. So myeloid, this is your colony stimulating factor, and it's GM. So that's the generic. So granulocyte would be here, and monocyte would be here, monomacrophage. Remember that macro monocytes are, are your blood macrophages. Once they get into the tissue, they're macrophages, okay? So let's go back to the question. So we say that they have neutropenia, okay? So they don't have neutrophils, or they don't have enough, okay? So if you, if you trace back to this, you could say, okay, IL-7A, no, because that's lymphoid. You say IL-3, yeah, that could work because, you know, you will get more of those there. Uh, granulocyte CSF, oh yeah, they're, they're definitely granulocytes, which we know from taking histology. And then GM, yes, that's generic to both of these, so yep, that's it. So it would be B, C, or D above, which is F. Okay, so this is something that, that you definitely want to commit to memory is how this goes because uh, not only will you see it on the USMLE or in your immuno class, but again, the most beautiful thing is there's actually drugs uh, that are basically, you know, synthetic versions of these cytokines so that they definitely have a therapeutic application. Okay, so the last question um, in this section is going to be, uh, which of the following, number eight, has the greatest immunogenicity? Which is a word I have difficulties with. In other words, when we're recognizing self from non-self, what makes us go, wow, that's non-self? And this is more or less a generic term, okay? So we have A, high molecular weight protein, B, a low molecular weight protein, C, a carbohydrate, or D, a lipid. And the answer would be A, a high molecular weight protein. If you think about this logically, right, is that for something to be really interesting, it has to be complicated, right? We find people who are interesting uh, to be quite complicated at times. It's the same way with the immune system in that um, everybody and their brother's got a lipid, everybody and their brother has a carbohydrate or a low molecular uh, protein. But if you see a complicated high molecular weight protein structure, that tends to be much more interesting to the immune cells than, you know, your basic carbohydrate. Because again, you're trying to differentiate self from non-self and we've got carbohydrates, we have lipids. So the thing that is not, um, that is not like us is the, is the most likely to get our immune system tweaked. Thank you.